Welcome to the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. This is our Sunday Sermon segment. I've entitled this message, Earthly Minded and Defeated. If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to turn to the New Testament book letter, Paul's epistle, to the Philippians in chapter 3. We're just going to look at the first few verses. The Apostle says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Dogs is a contemptuous phrase. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision, meaning those Jews who abuse Judaism. For we are the circumcision, talking about believers, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, as touching righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul is minimizing the arrogant, prideful boasting of Judaism, specifically circumcision. In his attack, he points out that we, Christians, are the circumcision. We who worship God in the Spirit, we who rejoice in Christ, we who put no confidence in the flesh, he applies circumcision to those who have confidence in the flesh. In this, he is not minimizing God's instruction to the Jews, but he is lending to their arrogance. In verse 5, he speaks, if any view, if anybody view his words as minimizing ritual circumcision, he quickly points out, and proudly so, that he was circumcised on the eighth day according to the law. That he was a Pharisee, the most zealous of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews. But that none of that justified him before God. And none of that or any other works will justify anyone before God. It's all show. It's all ritual. Law and self-righteousness. In verse 6, he talks about the zeal. You got zeal? I got more. Paul says, I persecuted the church. As opposed, when you talk about righteousness, which is in the law, I'm blameless. But the things that I counted as gain, I now count as loss for Christ. And doubtless I count all things but loss for for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is the law, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Paul's spiritual ambition to know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. To know Jesus Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings, the fellowship of his death. These are powerful words 
powerful concepts. Here Paul is referencing the purposeful investigation of Christ, to learn about him, to learn of him, to understand him intimately. For what purpose? To what end? Verse 11, that if by any, by all means, I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead, wherein nothing of this deadness that is our life is carried on. Is that your goal? Is that the goal of Christians today? Do any of us really know what any of this means? Do we think about it like this? This is not Paul wondering if he could do such a thing, because it's not a doubtful statement. This is Paul's expression of humility, showing up not from one who is superior, being an apostle, but from one who has a sense of worthy, unworthiness. His fondest desire in life is to attain, to reach the place of the resurrection of the dead. What does that mean? Well, it can mean a lot of things. But in this context, it's context, it speaks of our death to self, the putting away of our pride, our arrogance, our self-righteousness. And that we might put on Christ. Here and only here can we live the life God has called us to live. Meaning, in Christ. The abundant life that Jesus told his disciples he had come to give in John chapter 10, verse 10, is ours. We're human. We all live with death. Death hangs over our life. All human beings die. The body we have is not made of steel. It can be injured. It can be broken. It can be killed. But here we have the soteriological life, that quality of life unique to God, that transcends our physical being. The life that God gives to his children in abundance, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Most human beings have a, an innate fear of death, that cessation of life. But here the life and death that God is talking about is unique. It's not physical in the sense of a being that is animated in one who is not, but rather a quality of life, a quality of life that we can only have in Christ. Children are born to die. But there are two forms of death. One is physical. We know all about that one. But the other one is spiritual. If you are a born-again child of God, you understand spiritual death. You understand dying to self and to sin, saying no, putting it away, making that distinction. I want what Jesus is offering. I don't want that over here anymore. We have this life the Bible talks about. Present tense. It's here now. Not going to wait till we get to heaven to get. We got it now. But we're still human. We still have a sin nature. We are still prone to do wrong as God defines wrong. Living our lives according to our own dictates. The best any human being ever did or ever could still falls short of the perfect holiness of God. And it is this holiness of which Jesus now speaks and the Apostle Paul is building on. We are born alienated from the life of God. 
You ever see a two-year-old at play? That child is the embodiment of self and selfism. They can be the sweetest things on the planet until they want something you have. And then it's all about me, my, mine. Now, we train them to put that aside for the greater good, if we train them at all. Children today are not being trained like, well, they're just little dears. They're only two, three years old. They'll grow out of it. No, they won't. Oh, they'll stop acting stupid like that, but they'll find another way to be stupid. They'll always have selfism driving them. Parenting is about getting that under control. We've taken mom and dad out of the house for the largest part of a child's waking day. And we still think we're going to get the same product. We're giving that child to people we don't know. I mean, we know their name. We know where they live. We don't know who they are. And they're getting to imprint on those children. And we wonder what happened. We must train them to put aside all of this for the greater good. And some of this may be good, but it's not the greater good. And we must train them, if we train them at all. To understand this. It's called parenting. It's a lost art today. Death in the Bible is the life we lead without Christ. Alienated from the life that is God. Ephesians 4.18 And we do it because of heart blindness. Salvation is that event whereby we are converted from one to the other where the heart suddenly is lit up and can see what's real and what's not. Now, much of this is what we call in theology positional truth. Most believers experience this life only on occasion, but they stand in that place. It's the rare Christian who actually lives it out. But the Christian is called by God to live a resurrected life. Jesus said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Paul said that of Jesus. I got it backwards. His resurrection from a willing death, his sufferings imposed by sinful men without retaliation, a resurrection to new life, one that will never die. Look around. Look into your own heart. In the midst of whatever is your earthly lot, are you living above it? Or are you living in the midst of it? Or perhaps you're living under it. It's driving you. The phrase, the resurrection of the dead, is unique in Scripture. It is literally the out-resurrection from among corpses. The corpses are all those who are cut off from God, not having this quality of existence, this life from God. These are the people you work with, you play with, you, you go to church with in some cases. These are family members and neighbors and other people in the world who do not know Jesus Christ and the free pardon of sin. And Paul wants to reach that point where he's not among them. He is different being a saved man. He wants to live differently. He doesn't want people to look at him and see them. He wants people to look at him and see something different. Sitting in a chair right next to a corpse, but not being like that corpse. Not being irresponsive to whatever the circumstances are. Someone who does not share the goals of people like that, or even feel the way those people feel about life and about things. Do you live like that? I had an experience this week that tested my trust in God. 
I lost forty dollars this week. Two twenty dollar bills. I had them in my hand. A woman had just given them to me. I had gone to the bank and got four rolls of quarters for the business. Put out my own money. Came back and she thanked me so much and she gave me the money out of the company funds. My pattern would be to take that money and put it in my pocket. At the end of the day, when I got home and started taking things out of my pocket, that money was not there. I went out to the car. I made a phone call to the office, to the company, and asked one of the guys to go look in the van that I'd been driving all afternoon and maybe ask around. I went to the front desk and asked if anybody turned it in, but I never got that money. So how does a dead man respond to that? Well, it was mine to start with. But it was mine because God allowed me to have it. If someone found it and didn't make the effort to get it back to its owner, I pray that person will use it wisely, perhaps on something they need. If not, then I pray that person will remember the day God brought $40 into his or her life they weren't expecting. And that maybe he can do it again. Will I miss the $40? You better believe it. Will $40 change my life? No. And I prayed for that person, whoever he or she may be, you see, it's a heart thing. I'm dead. That money wasn't mine anyway. God allowed me to have it. Or I'm alive. I can be alive to this world and dead to everything God stands for. I can be dead to this world and alive to everything God stands for. That's the difference. And if I have anything at all, it's due to the power of God's sovereignty and love for me. I work for it. But in the end, it's not mine. I work for it because I have a body that still functions in such a way that allows me to do that. I didn't buy that. That came to me from my parents. I didn't make this job. They handed it to me. I had to ask for it. But they were much willing, very willing, to, and they're still willing to keep me, even though I'm getting old. It's that attitude that keeps me putting money in an offering plate every week to remind me, if nothing else, it's not mine. I would challenge you to look into your heart in the midst of whatever is your earthly lot. Are you living above it? Or are you in the midst of it? Or maybe you're under it. And it's, oh, it's burden. The phrase in the Bible, the resurrection of the dead, is unique in Scripture. It is literally the out-resurrection from among corpses. The corpses are all those who are cut off from God, not having this life. Paul wants to teach or reach that point where he's not among them in every aspect of his life. Sitting in a chair right next to a corpse, but not being like that sitting right there next to a corpse, but not responding the way it does. Not having the same goals, not even feeling the way it feels about the same things. To arrive at that place is to be removed from the place of death. Now do you realize that the frustrations, the irritations, the defeats of life come from the place of death? 
your marriage that isn't working the way it should, your health that isn't what you want it to be or is adding an extra burden to your life, your finances that never seem to be what you need or, or, or in such a way that keeps you down, your appearance, your goals, your fears, anything else that brings discouragement or anger or frustration into your life, all that comes from that place of death. Earthly things, worldly things, fleshly things, earthly values, fleshly desires, and the extent to which you focus on them, the extent to which you dwell on them, you are dwelling with corpses. Paul doesn't want us to live there, and neither should we. He wanted to get away from all that. Do you want to do that? Philippians 3.12 shows us he knew it would be a lifelong process. He shows us in verse 13 that he knew he had not yet attained. In verse 14, he talks about his perseverance. In verse 15, he encourages us to share in this goal. Be thus minded. Because the only alternative is to be otherwise minded. Verse 19, earthly minded. Can Christians be earthly minded? Look around. The answer is obviously yes. Paul saw it, verse 18, for many walk that way, many believers. And when they do, they're not walking the way Paul does. He says in verse 17, mark them, identify those patterns and purpose not to follow that. Today, the love cult, the judge not crowd, are seeking to eliminate all these distinctions, replacing it with something more akin to who or what they think they should be, rather than following Christ in deliberate submission to all things right and good, whether it's comfortable, whether it's pleasing, painful, whatever it might be. Do you see what he calls the people who have their own ideas about life? Verse 18. He calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is all about death, all about submission to the word, submission to the will of God. What are your ideas about life? Have you ever thought about them? Sit down, make a list. How do you respond to stuff? Some of us have quick tempers. Some of us are just basically selfish. Others are downright prideful. Me, I'm perfect. I don't have any of those problems. I bet you, if people watch my life, they could find them. It's humanity. And Jesus came that we might escape all that. How are you making out?